Hi everybody, it's Dan O'Connor. And today we're gonna to be talking about how to deal with difficult people at work. I'm gonna to try to focus on managers and supervisors because we've talked a lot about how to deal with coworkers or how to deal with your boss if they are a difficult person. But we haven't talked a lot about if you are the boss or a manager or supervisor, how to deal with difficult employees or passive aggressive employees. So what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> today I'm going to start out checking out your questions that you have here in this live stream and answering those. And if we have any extra time, I'm gonna check out some other questions as well. But I'm gonna start off with these right here today. <laughs> Thanks, Lady Tina. Lady Tina, by the way, if you have not seen Lady Tina, what is your web, uh, what is your channel name? I, I apologize, I forgot, because I'd like to tell everybody to go there. Lady Tina has a fantastic channel on things similar to what we talk about here. And I've just loved it. I've learned a lot from you, Tina. So thank you very much. And uh, this is the first time of on. I'm glad that you're here. Hey, S hey, Sack. <laughs> and Leah. Hi, guys. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm using a new platform today. And I think it's going to really help me be able to read the questions as we go along. But as I do that, if you could bear with me for one moment, I'm going to check out some other questions that I got. I just got one. That's it. I had a, let me make sure that I'm, I can't see where I'm focused. One moment, please. By the way, can you see me and hear me okay? <laughs> hey, Just Me Joe. I'm doing great, Drace. Thank you very much. Can everybody see me? I can't see myself, which is probably a good thing. Uh, hey, Lisa. Okay, so there I am. Okay. Oh, good. Everything looks like it's in the picture, but not, <laughs> not too much. Okay. I'm going to cut all of this out from the <laughs> final version when I am trying to figure out where my camera is. Okay, so I had a boss ask me how to deal with passive-aggressive employees. And that's actually what prompted this live show because she said that when she says things to this employee, they say things under their breath, uh, back talk type of things. So does anybody deal with that as well? Because today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through that and give you step-by-step -step tactics for that and other things. First of all, if you're having a problem with anybody at work, whether it's your boss or a coworker or whomever it may be, I always recommend giving people the benefit of the doubt that they do not know what they're doing. You know, when somebody is whispering things under their breath or muttering things, I'm going to assume that you really do not know that that's inappropriate. You don't know that you're doing it. And I'm going to assume that you have the best intentions because that way I, can t I tend not to go wrong. So with that in mind, I like to use a fallback duct tape script. And a duct tape script, if you haven't heard me talk about them, are going to be things like the desk script. The desk script is D-E-S-C. Here's uh, here is the <laughs> DSC. Describe the behavior, then give the effects of their behavior, then say what I want, and then give a consequence at the end. That's D E S C. Describe, effects, say what I want, consequences. However, who knows what we call what you put at the beginning of a script and what you put at the end of a script? Because you have to open with a bang and close with a bang. Because if they just remember the words that you say, you know, usually people don't really remember the words that we say. They remember how we make them feel. But if people do remember the words that we say, they're going to be the first line and the last line that we say. Like that will be the word. Those will be the words that they will be able to repeat back to us if they ever needed to, if they can. So what do we call those first lines and those last lines so that we can focus on them and really make them good? Anybody know? <laughs> we make those. Thank you very much, Colleen, for letting me know you can see me. Hey, and thanks, Colleen, from West Virginia. Uh, thank you, Judy. Okay, the lead-in line and the closing line are always going to be key. And I would say that that is true no matter what type of a difficult conversation you're having because you want to open them up correctly and open up the lines of conversation. And when you're done, you want to make sure that you finish and you don't trail on, as I would. Because you know how a lot of people will begin conversations using danger phrases. They'll say things like, Judy, we need to talk. <laughs> you know, Or if you say that to a man, even worse. Because 
Remember that there are phrases that we grow biochemical reactions in response to. We learn, for example, that nobody's ever said anything good after we need to talk. Therefore, when somebody says it to us, it closes the lines of communication and we brace ourselves for what's to come. Therefore, when you begin a conversation, I recommend using this three-step process for lead-in lines. And this would be true for whether it's my employee or my brother or my mother. Number one, use I language, meaning the very first thing I'm going to say if I need to talk to you about something is going to be about me, not about you. Number two, make them short. You don't want to trail on with your lead-in lines. Number three, use the person's name. For example, Marty, I'm frustrated. Marty, I'm concerned. Marty, I need your help. Once, once you've delivered your lead-in line, you want to put a big, fat, pregnant pause at the end of it. So you put a period, then a pause, take a breath, collect yourself, and then go for the script. So when you tell somebody, Judy, I need your help, people tend to lean into you and be like, oh, what about? What's going on? As opposed to if you were to say instead, Judy, we need to talk about what happened yesterday. That's when people tend to lean back and be like, oh, what, what about? So your lead-in lines are critical, and they open up the lines of communication because most people, you probably know what I mean, do not feel as though they are utilized for all of their talents and abilities and would say to you if they were asked, oh, yes, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally, all of my talents are used at work. I feel as though I'm totally developed and actualized. You know, people don't feel that way. Therefore, when we ask them for help, most people are more than eager and happy to ob oblige us. And when you craft your lead-in line, whatever it may be, think about it beforehand. You also want to beforehand craft your closing line. And a closing line is really intended for many things. One of the things it does is it gets us commitment from the other person. So if I just asked you for a change in behavior, if you agree to it, even if you weren't really on board to begin with, if I get you to agree and say, yeah, I'll change, I'll do that, I'm on board, you can count on me, whatever it may be, you're much, much more likely to actually do that and make that change because, well, now I've said it. I said I would. So keep that in mind. That's number one. You want to get people to say yes. Number two, I want to make sure that I am not trailing off at the end because if you're like me <laughs> and you don't have a plan, you tend to, when you're done with little difficult talks like this, say things such as, let's say that I'm going to deliver a talk about you coming in late. I'm just going to pick one you know, at random. John, I'm concerned. Yesterday you came in 15 minutes late, which meant you were at your desk with your ready light on once the clock finally hit 9.15 when your start time is 9 o'clock. When you do that, your coworkers have to cover for you and do work for which they are not paid. In the future, if you can make it here on time between now and the end of the year, which means, by the way, you're at your desk taking calls with your green light, ready light on, by the time that clock hits 9 o'clock, that means you're on time. Then come the end of the year, you'll be more likely to get that positive review that I know you have your eye on and possibly that raise as well. Can I count on you to do that? Like, let's say that I did not have the, can I count on you to do that ready? And I just used my natural instincts. <laughs> it would sound like this. So if you can do that, come the end of the year, it'll be more likely to get that raise that I know you have your eye on. And your coworkers would really appreciate that. And I wanted to bring this up because other than that, you're great. And you're, you're, you're one of my favorite employees, actually, you know, so I'm really glad that we have this talk. I just wanted to talk and there, you know, I said it. So now that's, if you have any questions, you don't have any questions, right? So, okay, well, that's, that's it. <laughs> you know, that's what I tend to do if I'm not paying attention. So that's why I want to have lead in line and a closing line. Or if you're like my sister-in-law, Michelle, who I hope was watching this today, <laughs> she might say something more like, Dan, you need to be on time from now on. Understand? All right. And then she would just walk away. And I have to say, I love my sister-in-law. She's one of the people who most contributes in her to her own self-development of anyone I've ever met in my life, actually. And she's... <laughs> You've come a long way, Michelle. No, no she's actually quite the savvy communicator. Uh, because between Michelle and me is assertive communication. Remember that aggressive communication is basically when people feel as though you're stomping on their rights. Passive communication is when you don't feel like you're getting your own rights and wants and needs met. Assertive communication is right in the middle where it's not that I'm saying everything that's in my mind. I'm honoring you and honoring me, getting my needs met while trying to meet your needs as well, creating that win-win. So 
If you have that lead in line or the lead in line and the closing line at the end, it helps you end with a bang and get people's commitment. And I like lead in lines such as oh, that are closed ended questions. That's the big rule. So you would say something such as, will that work for you? Are we on the same page? Can I count on you? And I realized that can I count on you? That's my favorite one, but you can't use that with everybody. So just make sure it's a closed ended question. Remember that a closed ended question is one where it gets a one word response. If I were to say to you, so where are you from? And you were to say, Fargo, that would be a closed ended question. If I were to say, tell me about where you're from, that gets people to say, well, and then they have to think about it and come up with a good one for you because they are not used to being asked, tell me about anything. So I wanted to throw that in because that was the question of the week. Okay, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. I've been working in total for six months with two difficult jobs and the only and only dealt with one difficult coworker. Good for you. I didn't know how to use my words, but would have said, please stop being inappropriate. You know, Brittany, that's not a bad strategy. If you, as I was just talking about at the beginning, if you expect people to behave a certain way with you, you have to tell people what that way is. The only thing I would add to that, Brittany, is instead of simply saying that you're being inappropriate, Really spell it out because when people, including myself, when people are acting in an inappropriate manner, most of the time they don't, they're not aware of it. And so if you were to tell, let's say Joe or whomever it may be at work, you're being inappropriate, that could send mixed messages. He could think that, for example, maybe his proximity to you is the inappropriate communication. He could think maybe the joke he just told was inappropriate. He could think that maybe if you two were alone together, that would be inappropriate. Maybe if it was a racist and a dirty joke, maybe it was the racist part that he, you know, clicked in, or maybe it was the the foul language that clicked. So let people know, for example, instead of you're being inappropriate, try to be very clear and say things such as those types of focusing on his behavior, not how you feel, and not even really him. Those types of racist, sexist jokes are inappropriate in the workplace. Just telling him that. Now, if he takes, if he does it again, then you might have to go one step further and say something such as, you know, I'm surprised that somebody who values their career would put it in jeopardy by telling that type of racist, sexist joke when we've already discussed how inappropriate it is here. But the one thing I might add is I would change that, what I just said, and try to focus on when you are calling out somebody's behavior, this is the big key. Okay, you ready? Put what they did at the very end of the sentence. That's actually the best way to do it. So if I were to say, who was that, Brittany? If I were to say, Brittany, I'm surprised that somebody who values her integrity and reputation so much would come to work dressed like that. <laughs> you know, if, if, that, if that were the thing that I wanted to, as a friend, <laughs> tell you, that would be at the end. If I were to say, if Brittany, let's say, were to come in late, and I wanted to point that out too as your supervisor, I would put that behavior at the very end. If I was just going to deliver one sentence, they said something such as, Brittany, I'm concerned that for somebody who values her career so much, you might be putting it in jeopardy when you come in late as you did today. That hangs at the end. And if that's all you're going to say, if it's a one-word sentence, you know, this isn't a big talk we're having, but I'm just telling you one quick thing as I pass by your desk. If I say that and then keep on walking, that's what lingers in the air, you know, that when you came in late, as you did this morning, and then just let people know with your nod of your head, I witnessed that. I see you. I know what's going on. So just let's, the biggest key is be specific because or else we can't blame people when they don't follow our instructions if they're not clear. All right. Yes, mostly with executives and leader. Leaders. Uh, this is Roxy. Hey, Roxy. Roxy. What a great name. Okay. I'm going back up because I believe that I might have skipped some questions. Okay. BJ Knotts. That's my favorite comment of all time. I'm going to favorite that. BJ Knotts bought the VIP, bought the VIP access on Black Friday. And it's been the best purchase of your life. I could. T I wish I could time travel and have learned this as a teen. Thanks, Dan. You ready, BJ Knotts? Uh, speaking of that, I have, for some reason, always been a magnet for people who are on the spectrum. The reason I mention that 
is not because of you, BJ. It's because of my cousin, Kathy, who was here just visiting over the holidays. And her son is on the spectrum. And he's one of my favorite people. And there's something about the way that I teach that people who are on the spectrum really resonate with that and get a lot out of it, it appears. Speaking of, you wish you had this as you were a teen. I get a lot of teen, teenagers and people in the classroom using my material. So if you do know somebody who's on the spectrum and would like to help them with some of this, but maybe you can't afford it. If you can't afford it, I just get it at the store. If you cannot or have a problem, let me know and I'll make sure that you can get whatever you need, especially for anyone who needs it on the spectrum and we'll work out something for you. But that's been coming up a lot lately. Hi, Dan. Sending you love from the mountains of West Virginia. Oh, yeah, Colleen. Hi. Okay, executives and leaders. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I got a comment here that says, from Roxy, that she gets a lot of this passive-aggressive stuff, I believe, from leaders and executives. And you don't believe that it's malicious, but they're just ignorant. And that's, generally speaking, going to be the truth. Because if we knew how to show everybody in the whole, wor in the whole world great love while getting our own needs met, we would all do that. Because once you do that, even just a little bit, once I do that a little bit, I start showing people more love, it's really difficult to go back, right? It's really difficult. Once you see, if you knew, for example, that you could legitimately, I don't know if it's how many people here earn a million dollars. <laughs> That's something I'm working on. If you knew that you could legitimately, legally, and with joy earn a million bucks, it'd be pretty hard to go back to the, you know, the, the daily grind to try and earn a million bucks once you knew the real way because it's easier, it's better, it feels better. So I generally give people the benefit of the doubt. And if somebody is being malicious or has deliberately talked to us with lovelessness, that's even more tragic for them when we really think about it the right way. And I have to remember, I have some affirmations that are, have just come out and if you signed up for the audio, it's, it's coming out today. But I have to remember that forgiveness is something I don't do for you. I do that for me because forgiveness really is a miracle that goes one in one, hand in hand with love. One of them can't be without the other. And I allow that to pass through me because it's not mine to begin with. But it blesses me and blesses the whole wide world at the same time. So when I forgive people because they are seeing things the right way and they're so desperate that they're treating me with lovelessness, that's a bad, that's a sad thing. So we can forgive them if I'm in my right mind and have done my daily affirmations. So make sure to check those out at Dan O'Connor Training. It really does help. Thank you, Judy. Uh, your video is very small. Not sure this will impact your recording. Oh no, my video is small. Thank you. I didn't know that. Hold on. Mom, <laughs> how small was my video? <laughs> it was like this the whole time. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> hey, Apna Jack. <laughs> Can I know where I'm from? Yes. I am from Fargo, North Dakota. And I, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. I lived in Fargo, North Dakota my whole life until, well, until I was 18. And then I went to Minneapolis, Minnesota when my brother told me, Dan, if you want to move, you just move. You don't have to, because I was trying to save up to move and get ready to move. And he was not that I didn't love Fargo because I love Fargo. But he was saying, if you want to move, you just do it, Dan. You, I, you just do it. There's not, there's nev you're never going to be ready to do it. So I said, okay. And I s went to live with my brother. Thank you, Marty. And then I was dealing blackjack <laughs> the casino there. Then I moved to Chicago and was dealing blackjack on the riverboats for like a, two years. I lived with my favorite cousin, Kathy, and who's a doll, by the way. Then, if you're watching, then I moved to, I went to Guadalajara, Mexico. Well, I went to Mazatlan with my mother because she was trying to make up for all of the sinful things that she has done over the years. And she brought my brother and me to Mazatlan, hoping to get a free pass out of hell. The jury is still out. So, <laughs> so when I was in Mexico for the first time, it was the first time I had left the Midwest and I'd never seen an ocean and I'd never seen a mountain and I'd never seen all that stuff. And I said, oh my gosh, if I go back, I was a stockbroker at the Equitable in Chicago at the time, right in front of the Playboy building. And I said, if I have to go back, I think I will jump off that roof and into the Chicago River. So I said, I'm going to take my tax return, which at the time was $209, if I remember correctly. I said, I'm going to take my tax return and I'm going to stay here. And as long as that $209 <laughs> will last me, 
So I went back to the card catalog department in the Fargo, North Dakota Public Library and researched where to move in Mexico if you don't know where to go. But I felt like it was calling me, Dan, Dan. <laughs> so I went to Guadalajara, which at the time, without internet, because that was the days before before most people had internet. And I didn't, cell phones didn't exist. So I went to Guadalajara and started teaching at the university there and stayed here ever since. Uh, I go back and forth between Fargo, North Dakota and Guadalajara, Mexico. Right now, I'm in Ajijic, Mexico. And if anybody's interested in retiring in Mexico, chances are it's going to be in this area. This is the number one area for retirees in the world. Uh, Americans. Number one expat community in the world. So I stay here half the year, go to Fargo and Chicago and Houston the other half of the year. Thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. Hey, Britt. Scene collections. I don't know what that is. Okay. I've been working in a total for six months. Oh, the inappropriate. Thank you, Brittany. We got that. <laughs> I need to have a difficult conversation about appropriate and polite conversation versus saying disturbing and hurtful things with one of my employees. And I'm dreading it. Drace, I'm so glad you said that. Because I dread conversations like that too. Which is why I... I'm trying to fix my screen. Which is why I started to study communication skills to begin with. It's just like I think most people who are psychologists or psychiatrists, they have something that they are curious about or want to help themselves or someone they love with. And I believe that that's why I studied communication so much because I get so nervous and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and all that jazz. So what I recommend you do is this. If you're dreading it, Drace, the key, you're always going to dread it a little bit, a little bit, not so much. It'll go away a little bit. Once you see it, in action a few times. Once you actually do it and think, I did not know I was capable of that. A few times, you'll dread it less. Not totally, but you will dread it less. The way you get to that point is practice your scripts. So, Drace, if you have to have a difficult conversation with somebody, especially an employee, I have to remember principle, one of the nine principles, I am in charge of every relationship in my life. So, you are going to be in charge of that conversation. Pick out the main points that you want to ensure that you address during that conversation and write them down on post-it notes or I'm going to grab some post-it notes. I'm always using post-it notes just like my dad did. Uh, write them on post-it notes or index cards. I normally have index cards. I just ran out of them and they are not at the papeleria like they normally are. So let's say, for example, Drace, that I wanted to talk to you about inappropriate jokes. So I'm going to write that on my index card. And I try to choose one issue at a time, actually. So if someone's behavior in general is inappropriate, if they have an inappropriate affect, if the inappropriate way about them, and they are frequently just making faux pas one after another, on purpose maybe, <laughs> which wouldn't be a faux pas, then what I would want to do is choose that as my one central theme. And if you're dreading it, remember, make cue cards that help you Follow the script that you've decided on. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to use a desk script. I would jot that down on cue cards, but I would do it in this way, Drake, okay? And this is what I recommend in my courses. If you've ever heard me talk about my flashcards, this is what I mean. And by the way, we're putting together an app because my cousin Kathy clued me in that I'm the only one who prints things out anymore. Thanks, everybody else. <laughs> so on a cue card, what I would write is something like this. Drace. This is for Drace. Let's say that I was going to use the desk script. I might put D, E, S, C. But if I were to write D, E, S, C, I would not write little words after that. Because if I'm having a conversation with somebody, especially me, who I can't see a thing without my glasses on. By the way, if anybody here is sponsoring glasses, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs> uh, I would draw pictures. The reason I would draw pictures is because of this. Let's say that you were to be telling inappropriate jokes at work, okay? That's the issue. You just, you have an inappropriate way about you. Okay, if you're going to be telling nasty jokes, I might draw like a joker smile. If you're going, if I'm going to tell you, that really brings down the morale of your employees who try their best to adhere to professional protocol and norms. Then I might adhere, adhere. I might draw a thing of glue. 
because glue reminds me of adhere. Then, if I were to say what I want, what I want is for you to take a course on professional etiquette and protocol because evidently you have not taken that course. Or if you have, you need to retake it because I believe that you are able to adapt to different environments. If not, you might be a sociopath. So I'm going to say what I want, and that's going to be a course. I'm going to draw a picture of a book. Okay? No, I won't. I'm going to draw a picture of Dan O'Connor Training's logo. That's what I'm going to do. Then the consequence of you doing this would be you would make more money and you'd have happy people. Okay? If I were to do that, I might do this on four separate cards. For example, if I thought this conversation is going to be difficult, he might interrupt me a lot. So what I'm going to do is prepare for that and have four different cards. I'm going to tell him I need to say what I have to say and get it out. So please don't interrupt me, knowing that he's going to do it anyway. And I'm going to take these four cards and put them in front of me where they're not so obvious, but it doesn't matter if you see them because you can't even interpret them. All they are are symbols. You know, it's like hieroglyphics. So I might put those right in front of me. And there's nothing ever wrong with looking at your cue cards while you're speaking, while you're giving a speech, while you're having a conversation, de delivering a difficult message. Some people don't want to take notes, and I'm not really sure why, because when I watch professionals and respected speakers speak, frequently they will use notes, and no matter what the situation is. So have your notes handy, and if you want to look at them, look at them. Don't be bashful about it. Look right at them and then look back up. You might want to tell them, I've taken a few notes so that I don't miss anything important. And Look down at your notes. It will only take you a minute to register. This is why I put pictures. There are several reasons. One is because when you put a picture down, you know, you write it, you draw it. Like it's just a symbol that reminds you of what that section is about. You will be able to look at it even from a distance and immediately remember what you were referring to when you drew that picture. So you'd look at that, look right back at him, deliver that part of the talk or the conversation. If there were some key points, make pictures for them, you know, draw little notes, look back up deliver that part. And when you're done with each section, what I do is, if I'm delivering a big speech or a keynote address, I will take, once I've said whatever I need to say there, I'll take, I'll take that note card. And Marty, if you're watching this, you know you can attest to this, that I still do this all the time, every speech I give. Take that note and I'll put it over there in the done pile. Then, when this talk is over, when this speech is over, when I believe it's over and I'm about to go or break or say goodbye, if I look down and there are still some note cards there, that means that there are still some issues that I haven't addressed or there are still some things that I have yet to say that are important. So I'm going to make you sit there <laughs> if you're the audience. No, nope, we're not going to break yet until I flip over every single one. Then I know I'm ready because I've said what I had to say. So in your meeting, what I really recommend you do is this. Drace, choose a strategy. Choose your lead-in lines, your closing lines, your closing lines. Practice them with friends and family. Practice using scripting, staying on track. Then, once you've done that, I recommend, this, this is going to be way out there for a lot of people, and please bear with me. When I give a speech, if I'm giving a keynote, I'll practice that keynote a lot, and I'll practice that any course that I give a lot. But when I'm about to speak, when I'm about to go into the meeting, if it's a difficult one, when I'm about to deliver a keynote, I will stop and I'll say, Okay, God. Now, you might not be a God person. You might be a universe person. You might be a nothing person. If you were my brother, you'd be a nothing person. So, a, hey, nothing, <laughs> whatever you talk to. I realize that I have a message that I have planned on delivering to this person or that person or this audience. Please take that message from my head and replace it with the message that they are supposed to hear that comes from you. Because I can't think like the divine. And if I want a divine brain. I have to ask that mine be removed first and then put in its place. So if I have a bunch of words in my head or a bunch of things that I believe people need to say, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, what I will frequently do is right before, just take a breath and say, okay, all right, universe, okay, God, please help me clear my mind so that I can make room for the divine thoughts or the divine message that is in store for these people that is not mine to give, but will come through me if I can clear out some space. So I recommend you do that as well. And if you do that, and if you have a personal compass as well, so that you are walking into that meeting prepared, if all else fails, I know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know what I want. And in these moments in time between event and response, between the person that you're talking about says or does something and how you respond to it, if you can pause in that second in time, you know, if he says something outrageous to you, for example, and you are about to react to it, but you pause, the miraculous instant is the instant between event and response. And it's the instant when, when facing 
what could be a cycle in our life, because I'm going to guess that this is not the first time you've dreaded these types of talks. And I'm going to guess it's not the first time if you were to walk away from it, not really feeling good about it, it wouldn't be the first time. That would be a cycle. And if you want to break the cycles in your life and create turning points, the way you do that is during that miraculous instant where you have the opportunity between event and response to do this, you remember who you are. What happens is most of us forget. And so what I believe is if you say something nasty to me, I'm spouting off and saying something even nastier to you because I can do that. You know, I can I can engage in a battle of wits, especially with the unarmed at work. But that's not who I really am. That's who at the moment I was tricked, I was drugged into believing I was. That's really the key to communication is being able in these moments in time that present themselves to us all the time. And they were presented to us by difficult people who are masking, who are or by master teachers, actually, <clears throat> who are simply masquerading as difficult people. <clears throat> there are moments that are presented to us all the time. And we tend not to recognize them. In retrospect, we do, but we don't recognize them as they are presented to us. Practice doing your personal compass so that in those moments you can remember who you are. And that will create a miraculous instant. And in those cycles, you will instead create a turning point and you will be on an entirely new trajectory in terms of communication for the rest of your life. So I recommend you do that. <laughs> Easy breezy. Okay. Lubries. Lube oh, blueberries. <laughs> blueberries. I need to get in the glasses again. If someone took a temper tantrum before you, okay, if someone took a temper tantrum before you made your point, how do you handle that? If somebody threw a temper tantrum before I was making my point, it... I don't even know if it matters so much if it were at work or at home. Temper tantrums, I have to remember, are is a form of difficult behavior that is intended to distract from the truth, that is intended to, sim instead of addressing the reality of the situation, it's like a crybaby. Crybabies cry. Now, I'm not talking about people who cry. A crybaby will start to cry so that Instead of addressing their behavior or the issue at hand, we will instead divert attention. That's what I'm thinking of. Divert attention and focus on the crying. Or we will divert attention and focus on the temper tantrum and therefore give in to them. So just like a crying or other, any other form of aggressive, outrageous, inappropriate behavior, I want to do my best to completely disregard it and ignore it. And at work, for example, or at home, <laughs> My mom used to do this. She would totally ignore those types of tantrums, knowing that what gets rewarded gets repeated. So remember that. What gets rewarded gets repeated. Ask yourself, this person who threw the temper tantrum, this could be a cycle for you. Have they done this before? Even if they haven't, have I dealt with this before? Because I'll have to tell you, I have not dealt with, personally, temper tantrum people, except for my brother. See, I don't have any friends except for my family, and every type of difficult person is represented in some version, in some person in my family. Marty, I'll, uh, as perfect as he is, was the one who threw temper tantrums. I was not. I had other forms of difficult behavior. If you reward difficult behavior, it will get repeated. It's when we stop rewarding it, and maybe you don't know how you reward it, but if this is in a work situation, for example, and they were, like if I were in the Senate floor and McCarthy were spouting off and distracting from the truth, you know, and saying that they were just, they were having a teddy bear parade on the January 6th. So I don't know what everybody's problem is. And why didn't you just get a, you know, candied apple and call it a day? If I am on the Senate floor, I'm pretty bound what I can do about that, right? So if you're at work, maybe you're pretty bound what you can do about that. At work, not so much. But what you are always in control of is how you reward that. And some of us are rewarding in ways that we're not aware of. We might be rewarding by engaging. We might be rewarding by addressing the behavior. We might be rewarding by distracting. So just ask yourself, if this is a pattern with you, how can you break that is stop rewarding the behavior because what gets rewarded gets repeated. What does not rewar get rewarded does not get repeated. And if you must address it and acknowledge it and somehow validate it as though it were normal behavior, some version of, all right, Charlie, are you done? Now, you may want to use a boundary statement if the person is encroaching on your boundaries. And a boundary statement, is, I, the situation's a little vague for me right now. A boundary statement sounds like this. 
Charlie, I do want to help you with this and listen to everything that you have to say, but not like this. Or you could be more specific. Charlie, I do want to listen to what you have to say and hear how you feel about this, but not if you're going to be yelling and screaming and calling names. Not if you're going to be blah, blah, blah. Describe the behavior. If you cannot, just, Charlie, I do want to help you with this, and I do want to hear everything you have to say, but not like this. You might want to give a, okay, I'm thinking of another one. You might want to give a redirect with assumptions. A redirect with assumptions is, I'm redirecting your behavior assuming that it's going to change, and I'm going to tell you in advance what your reward will be. So, Charlie, when you are ready to talk to me as a professional and lower your tone and discuss what we have to say rather than scream it, I'll be ready to continue this conversation. That's a, when you're ready to, I'll be ready to. A lot of us use that with our children. You might want to give an empowering statement. After you deliver a, <laughs> after you deliver a redirect with assumptions, it sounds like this. Are you ready to do that now? Or would you like a few minutes to regain your composure? So I might say, putting it all together, Charlie, I do want to hear everything you have to say, but not if you're going to be yelling and screaming like this. So when you're ready to talk to me as the professional that I am, now I realize that they're going to be interrupting you at this point. So you want to remember to regain the floor from somebody who's interrupting you. Use their name over and over again. Charlie, 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 Charlie. Because when we keep using somebody's name, just like our kids do with us, mom, 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 we feel compelled no matter, even if we know it, that they're trying to just knock us off our platform, we feel compelled to say, what? And then they're like, ha, works every time. So use their name, Charlie, 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 to get the floor back and say, finish, finish your redirect with assumptions. So when you're ready, Charlie, to talk to me as the professional that I am and speak to me without name calling or yelling, I'll be ready to continue this conversation with you. Would you like a few minutes to regain your composure or do you think you'd be ready now to continue? That's an empowering statement giving you a choice, making you believe that you have some power here rather than just stripping it from you because nobody likes to feel as though they are called out on their behavior. So that's a fine line we sometimes walk because we all have different forms of the same affliction and none of us like to be called out on our behavior, especially in front of other people. So if I'm going to do that to you, I'm going to try to do it in a gentle way, in a, even in a loving way, trying to remember that you're just not in your right mind right now and I'm going to try to help you get into your right mind because that whatever you're exhibiting there, it's just a different form of the same affliction. I have a different form. That's all. I'm not telling you what it is, but I have that in me that wants to distract from my negative behavior. So try to be compassionate and don't reward that behavior, whatever you do. Okay, blueberries. Oh, that's that was you, blueberries. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I skipped a whole bunch. Oh, thanks. T. Curry. For the heck of it, give us your best conversation starter. Okay, T. Curry. My best conversation starter is this. T. Curry, it's going to sound super simple. Watch how many people do not do this. And it blows people away every time. And I love doing it, okay? <laughs> I just walk up. This is, I'll, give you, I'll give you a little bit more because I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for. But I'll walk up and I'll say, hi, I'm Dan. What's your name? And extend my hand to shake it, to shake their hand. If you can do that, if you can confidently, you know, you, I'm not always feeling confident, but if you just remember, I'm going to put my shoulders back as though I were confident. I'm going to lift my chin up as though I were confident. And I'm going to smile as I look you in the eye and say, hi, I'm Dan O'Connor. What's your name? And tilt my head a little bit to the side, which is showing that person, hey, don't be afraid of me right now. I'm not going to be aggressive. I'm going to be, you know, easy to deal with. Sounds simple to say, hi, I'm Tim. What's your name? Nobody does that. Almost nobody. And it floors people. It makes, it makes everybody think, oh, I'm going to talk to him or her because they know what they're doing. They are confident, savvy. They, they've got this down. They know what the steps are. They know the protocol. Then after you do that, if you simply start off a, a, whatever the conversation is with, so tell me about anything. You know, So tell me about what brings you in here. Tell me about your day so far. Tell me about what you think of that class. If I'm meeting people at school, so tell me about what you thought of this morning's class. Tell me about your experience so far at school. Tell me about your family. Tell me about where you're from. If you just begin with, tell me about, that's it. You can take any of the questions that you hear other people asking, for example, and just instead of saying, so do you like the party so far? Are you having a good time? Where are you from? What do you do? <laughs> you know, th those are all questions that I just listed right now that are actually designed to shut people down. And so a lot of us go around asking questions like that, thinking that they are conversation starters and that they are 
that we're just dealing with difficult people who is like pulling teeth to get them to talk because I just asked you five questions and all you did was say, yep, no, Fargo, yep, see. Instead, so tell me about what brings you in here today. Tell me about your experience so far. Really? Tell me about what you do for a living. Wow, interesting. Tell me about where you did that. Where are you from? Tell me about where you're from. Tell me about your family. You will be the most fascinating person in the room, even though you're just asking other people about themselves. So that is the, that's the trick I use. And I use it all the time. Thank you, T. Curry. But that, that's it. Oh, let me see any other big green blocks. Hold on. <laughs> okay. So there you go. I hope that answers your question. Unless you're talking about dating, which I don't think you are. That'd be a premium question. Anyway. And it works every time. My cut my hey, I wanted to ask you all. <laughs> my cousin Kathy. <laughs> I mean my cousin Roberta just asked me while she was here, Dan, do you ever write online profiles for you know dating profiles? And I'm like, Do I? So I helped her with hers because I there's something about it that I don't know why, but I have a knack for that. So I told her, she'll help you with yours. And she got like that day, that day she got a notice from, from Match.com saying, hello, I don't know what you're doing, but you all of a sudden have like 40% more views than the average person when before you didn't have any views. So that said, I was thinking about putting together like a little one hour course on how to do that, because there is a very specific way you want to write an online dating profile to have immediate success. Now, you might get a lot of, you know, a lot of people that might not be your type, but you'll get a lot of people so that you can choose from them. If you're interested in something like that, or if you think other people would be, let me know. Because I was telling her, gosh, I've always toyed with that because they're so successful, but that's a little different from what I normally do. But it's the same kind of bailiwick. Okay. Thank you, Leah Campbell. I appreciate... Leah Campbell. Do I know you? Are you from Minnesota? You're welcome, Leah. Sarah Cunningham. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for what you do. You're welcome, Sarah. You're from the Midwest, too. Woohoo! Saint. My brother is in St. Paul. I lived in St. Paul, Minneapolis. In fact, that's where I moved when I moved out of the house. I was working at the Mystic Lake Casino. <laughs> My brother right now lives on... Where does he live? Eigelhart Avenue. Right off... Uh, is it Blaisdell, I think? In St. Paul. So, good. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sweetie Katri, good name. Hey, Dan, it's, it's Sweetie. Sweetie, Sweetie, my communication skills is very poor. What do I need to do? Please tell me how I should start. Okay, Sweetie. How? Hey, Drace, thank you, Drace. I appreciate that. Um, a lot, a lot. Drace donated five bucks. Woo, and I got a flying monkey this time. I love this platform. This is, oh, I'm not going to tell you who I'm using because I'm waiting for the sponsor. <laughs> but, Sweetie, my communication skills are very poor. What do you need to do to get started? What I recommend to do getting started is simply going to my website. I'm going to put a link in the description. Even if I don't, send me an email, dan at danoconnortraining.com. Start off with your communication starter kit, the professional starter kit. That will have the tools that I use that I think you would use to get started if you've never used them. Personal compass, danger phrase, power phrase list, and flashcards, templates. Listen to the, excuse me, watch the videos I have on YouTube or just listen to them. And there's a little bit of everything in there. You will find different areas that are your strengths. Do not start, please, with your weaknesses. The reason I say that is a lot of people will say, I'm really bad in this area. Will you help me with it? This is my point of weakness. Will you help me with that? I just don't believe that because think about it this way, sweetie. I don't know what your strength is, but you have one. Everybody has, your, you know, if, if you think your communication skills need improvement, we all do. Everybody does. But there's some area that you're going to have that's going to shine more than anybody else's. And let's say that I had two glasses of water. Oh, this is going to be the most, the most horrible, <laughs> the most horrible example ever. This is that I have two glasses of water. And in one glass, I... I say, I'm not good at filling this glass up. So I'm, well, here, it's filled with traits, <laughs> your communication traits. And I'm going to focus on those negative traits to try to improve that. The ones that I, excuse me, not negative, the ones I struggle with. I'm going to focus on my weaknesses. And I'm going to keep trying to focus on those until I fill my glass with communication traits. That would take forever because that's, 
the weakest natural points. The, those are your weaknesses, I should say. So it would take forever to get that glass full with strengths and good things. If, however, I say, you know what? I have this section here that's my strength, and I'm going to focus on that and growing that. You will fill your glass up so much more quickly. We're always going to have weaknesses. So while you're going through my videos, check the ones that you think, I'm good at that. I like that. I found great success with that. And focus more on that so that, you know, if you are like uh, my mother, <laughs> my mother's, for example, one of the most forgiving people I've ever met, which she really should, especially with all of the, you know, what do you call it? Um, the the uh, felonies. When, while she might be more of an aggressive type, that's maybe a weakness of hers. She just told me yesterday, actually, through the glass, you know, the phones. She said she realized that she's a fighter and that she looks for fights and that she can do that. You know, she, she if she hasn't had a good fight lately, she was going to fight with the cabinet man yesterday because he did not bring her cabinets back to her kitchen as soon as he could. So he, she was going to find him at his house. And I know she would have had we not stopped her. And she was going to let him know where he could stick his cabinets. <laughs> hey, thanks, Kay. Thanks, Kay. <laughs> Kay, I love it. You have a... I got to work on those uh, emojis that come up. Thank you, Kay. But my mother, when, <laughs> when we talked her down off the ledge, said, you know, that's always been a weakness of mine is I've always been looking for fights. And I shouldn't do that anymore. So instead of her focusing on that, what she could do is find more places to express her beautiful, forgiving, forgiving nature and let that blessing flow, flow through her because that's a natural for her. And she can teach people. A, she's taught me a lot about forgiveness and love and accepting and being non-judgmental and making people feel comfortable and making people feel safe. So she makes some mistakes every now and then and looks for fights, you know, hunts down our carpenters and threatens their family. You know, if you can be a forgiving person, people will let you get away with that more, a lot more. Okay. Smart. Hey, D-Tata. d to data Any advice for dealing with a coworker who makes snarky jokes as outbursts during meetings? I'm not sure if everyone hears the insults or if people are just ignore them. Yeah, d to data I wish you'd tell me how to say that name correctly. It sounds like what they are doing is, well, that's that's passive aggressive behavior. And it sounds like there may be sniping. Sniping is when people make pot shots at you masked in humor in a public forum. They tend not to do that in private as much as they would do it in public because they, they like the fanfare. They like the audience, you know. So if it's something that is, you want to ask yourself these three questions in a situation like this, I believe. Does something need to be said? Does something need to be said by me? And does something need to be said by me right now? If those three questions are yes, move forward. If they are not, if one of them is, well, maybe not by me. Maybe it wasn't directed at me, but I'm in the meeting and it bothers me. If it's not direct, if, if you cannot confidently say, yes, something needs to be said by me right now, you know, then don't. Because what we tend to do is tarnish our reputation by saying too much. If, however... What they are doing is stealing the floor from you during these meetings. That's not okay. And that's when you need to address the situation. Do it at the time and ask the sniper a spotlight question. A spotlight question. I love spotlighting people. My mother talks a lot about spotlighting people. When you directly call people out on their behavior and you are not adding any facts, you are simply narrating the situation maybe or asking a question. That's a very powerful thing to illuminate a, a scene. Remember that we don't want to engage in battles. We don't want to rise above battles that are given to us to fight. What we can do, however, is illuminate the battlefield. And when we do that, when we shine light on it and say, hey, hey, this is what's going on here. Right? Am, am I seeing this correctly? Magical things happen when you cast light on things. Remember, <laughs> darkness is simply the absence of light. You cannot... You cannot cast out darkness with more darkness. So I might say to Trixie, if she were, you know, 
sniping me in a meeting. I might give her a, a, a blacklight question sounds like, excuse me, a spotlight question sounds like this. Are you trying to, and then fill in the blank. That is a lead-in line for a spotlight question. Jamie, are you trying to disrupt this meeting? Jamie, are you trying to embarrass me? Jamie, are you trying to say that you didn't like that idea? Jamie, are you trying to say you need to go to the bathroom? Jamie, are you trying to, what are you trying to do, Jamie? What are you, you know? So you might want to, now, if I want to take that a step further, a, a spotlight question simply, when you use lead-in lines to start what you're saying, it helps you end it. So if I wouldn't know what to say, if you practice, remember, if you practice saying spotlight questions and remember that they start with, are you trying to? Are you trying to? That will help you get the words out when you need them. So if you need to make it a little bit bigger, you might want to ask a clarifying question that sounds like this. When you say this or when you do that, do you mean to say that or do you mean to say this? Jamie, when you laugh like that under your breath, are you trying to say that you think that was a ridiculous idea? When you make comments like that under your breath so that I can't hear them, are you trying to be disrespectful during this meeting and show me that you don't care about my ideas? Clarity is key because you can't fault me for that. I always want to be beyond reproach if I possibly can in those types of situations. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to make it difficult. You know, I don't want to crush you. I want to make you as gently as I can aware of the behavior that you're engaging in, which you're evidently not aware of. Because, I mean, my mom, she's done some pretty outrageous stuff. <laughs> yes, she has. Which is why she's probably, you know, going down later. But she didn't know. She didn't know. Now she knows. She's going to pay. <laughs> she's doing. Okay. I love you, Mom. I'm joking, by the way. She's at home today. Today is, my mother is the one who... She is, she, I always dedicate my books to her because she's the one who gave me the words, all of the words. My father gave me a lot, but he didn't give me the words. My mother gave me the words. And her father, if you ever want to see who I inherited my words from, my, my, bro, my mother and I watched a video of my grandfather. I grew up with my grandparents in the house, and we just watched an interview with my grandpa. If you look up Boyd Christensen interviews, Judge Ronald N. Davies. Uh, my grandpa was the judge who decided the Little Rock Nine case back in the 50s, I think, where he said, you know, integration must come forthwith and integrated the schools. And the reason he was able to do that, I believe, is because he prepared his entire life for that one moment in time where he was given an opportunity. And between that moment, between event and response, between those moments, he remembered who he was. He always knew who he was. Always. And in that interview that I watched, Boyd Christensen interviews Judge Ronald and Davies. It was on YouTube, I believe. The way he spoke was beautiful. It was, be it was beautiful. It was a sonnet every time he opened up his mouth. And it makes me laugh. As soon as I see him coming on, I just get so tickled. I start to go, ha, 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 gramps, gramps. Because I know what he was doing his whole life. He was trying to tickle everybody he came into contact with and inspire them in a little bit, in a little way. And he did just that. And then he, ins he inspired my mother so much that she eventually, with my help, learned how to communicate and gave me some words in the end. So thank you, Mom. I love you. And I have to stop because it's somebody just pulled up. Hold on. <laughs> okay. I'm hearing something ding, and I don't know why. Okay. I'm going to... Oops. Hey, you know what happened? I just got a new phone. Oops, somebody saying, stop it, Dan. Uh, thank you so much, Drace. I'm glad that you got it. Tina Ra Radojevic from Serbia. Thank you, Dan. You helped me a lot. I managed to set boundaries and have more confidence. You're welcome, Tijana. Or Jana, I bet. And Yvonne. Okay, the other day, and it worked and it worked a treat. <laughs> Devon, where are you from? I was given, I was being given someone's crappy chore while they went to do a nice task. He had no answer for me. Good, Devon. It feels good when you just, it's, it's, it's like counterintuitive. When we are in difficult situations, we want to be difficult. It's the most difficult thing to do to be authentically ourselves and not engage and simply 
be straightforward, clear, and direct, and honest in our communication. It's, it's sounds simple. It is the most difficult thing to do and still be who we are. Um, can you please make a TikTok? I've never made a TikTok. Should I do that, Jen? I have no, I have no idea how it is. I will do, I'm going to write that down on my list of tasks. My mother and I are writing task lists. That's not, that's my weakness. Time management, stuff like that. So I'm going to write TikTok for Jen. Any topic suggestions? <laughs> I mean, I might as well. How do you deal with a coworker who is very rude? Can't say please or thank you when she asks me to do things in a really rude way. Blanks me when I say good morning. I don't know what blanks me means. Mom, why are you calling me? Stop it. Okay. Um, blanks me. I'm not sure what that means, but I believe it means she doesn't answer you. Yeah, oh, hold on. My mother, just one sec. Hello? Hi, Mom. Dan? Yes? I think it might be time for you to remind people of your course, Step Out of the Shadows and Speak, so that those people who want to begin their communication journey have a great um, outline. Okay? Just thought I'd tell you that. Th thank you, Mom. Bye. I love you. Bye. <laughs> that was Mom. So, <laughs> so... <laughs> she said she that's true if you're looking for a starter course the first course I ever did is still my favorite and it's the most comprehensive course I'd ever done because I was just like I was desperate to get people as much information as I could in one shot and it's called step out of the shadows and speak it's available in our online store at danoconnortraining.com and it's it has a little bit of everything it has dif different difficult people sections it has speaking in public it has Professional communication, personal communication, dating, uh, family life, uh, body language. Gosh, it has it all. Principles of the week. It has it all. I'm going to get that program again. It was, was rocked. That was the best program ever. So if somebody is looking for an all-over, an, an, an all-inclusive program, especially if you're just starting, that is true. That's where I would start. Okay. I apologize. I have to get going. I just want to make sure if anybody... Ignore, ignores me. It's a UK phrase. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Okay. So the person who's, okay. Thank you. With the coworker who is rude. Okay. So Lisa, the coworker is very rude. Okay. Here's what I really think. Just having heard it, you're obviously not purposely very rude. You believe that this coworker is purposely very rude all the time. I'm thinking that you internalized this and you have carried this around and you think sometimes, you know, she's rude to you and that shouldn't be or she's rude to everybody and that, you know, what the heck? And you carry this around without knowing the back story. If you did, you would go, oh, God, of course. Why didn't, oh, I'm, of course. Can I help you with in any way? I will never... Never bring that up again. I understand now. Right? Because that's how we feel once we know anybody's backstory. We understand it all. And we think, oh, I love you now. I love you. So what I would do is, if you find a point that you believe, where you believe this person would be receptive, where this person asks you <laughs> for some help, you can tell them, give them some tips. But remember that if you really want to teach them, for them, if you want to give them the gift of, I want you to have some communication skills because it will benefit you in life, the best way to teach is by demonstration. It's really the only way. Be the person that you want her to be. You know, Be that person to her. That's the best you can do, and it will have the greatest impact. And we really do not know. Everybody's carrying around a whole universe inside of them that could be affecting the way that they're behaving right now with you, and it would all make sense if you knew. Don't take it personally because they are not thinking about you when they go home at night. They are not on this channel asking, why, <clears throat> you know, can I, how can I get this, this Pollyanna Sarah off my back? She's always looking at me and trying to get me to change and be more like her. <laughs> you know, she's not doing that. But there's something about her that made you want to change her. I'm wondering if this is a pattern. If it is, Lisa... Make it a turning point and remember who you are. Are you here to teach lessons or to learn lessons? Are you here to 
you know, shine light into the darkness? Or what? What are you here to do? Do that and be that person with her. And that will be the greatest gift you can give her and everyone else at the same time. It's just, it's a, it's a no lose. So I, I, I really caution everybody when we are focused on one person trying to change them and teach them lessons we got to watch that because that's one of the most dangerous things we could do. It not only takes us off track and st- takes the focus off of who we should be focusing on as ourselves, and it's it never accomplishes anything. And it, it's just a big lesson in frivolity and, and tedium. Instead, be that fo- just focus on you. Be that person, and you can't go wrong. And they will learn lessons from you. They can't help it. I just did. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I have to... Michelle, motivate me. Hey, Michelle. How are you? It's really good to see you. Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Marchand is one of my inspiration people as well. Thank you for stopping by. I appreciate that. And the affirmations are available today, BJ. They're going to be, I don't know where, but I will make sure you all know where they are. I'll put down a link in this lesson and the other lesson that I did. I am a terrible time manager, but I'm going to try to manage time as best I can. Any tips on public speaking? Yes, Aaron. The biggest tip I have is, honestly, before you begin, (coughs) pardon me, before you begin speaking, now this may, again, I said this earlier and it may sound like the opposite of what you should do, but generally the opposite of what we're thinking is the right thing to do. If we're thinking off the top of our head, before you speak, just Pray if, or if you know, if you're, if you know somebody who's a ghost now, talk to them, talk to the universe, to Buddha, to Shiva, whoever it may be, to nobody, and say, I. If you want your speech to just be rocking and get people to cry and think, oh my God, my life has changed, ask whomever, ask the powers that be, ask the divine, <clears throat> to take the thoughts from your head. And clear out some of that rice bowl, if you know what I mean. You got to clear out some space and ask the divine to replace your brain with a divine brain, to replace your words with divine words. Help me forget the message that I was practicing saying to these people today, because no matter how good it is, it is not your message. I can't deliver your message, but in this moment in time, I can be the, the messenger and let that message flow through me. If I can clear out the brain and those all of these preconceived notions and and these this agenda and these talking points that I had, maybe the universe or something bigger than me has something better than me that it wants to deliver and that it could bless these people with. And if I can make room and put my ego aside to receive that message and deliver it. I just bless the crap out of people <laughs> you know, when, when, when that can happen. And it just feels so good to think, I learned something today and created a turning point because I stopped taking myself so seriously and thinking that my message is the only message. Maybe there's something more divine. And if I can allow that to flow through me, it's all blessings all around. So that's my biggest tip on public speaking. That said, I do have a, <laughs> a section on public speaking in the step out of the shadows course, because I do have a system apart from that that I use. Because one time, well, we'll just leave it at, (laughs) I always have a system so that let's say that I clear out my rice bowl and I clear out all the words and I'm standing there going, humada, 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 come on, come on, come on, fill it up again. I got to have a fallback plan. It's when you have your fallback plans, that alleviates so much of the nerves. So I will... I have that plan. It's it's. I know it's in my online courses. I think I did a YouTube video on it. But if you want more information on public speaking, send me an email and I will try to direct you to the right resources. I have to get going. Please, everybody, remember if you're with somebody right now, I hope, I hope you're with somebody that you love and that loves you back. And I hope that you only speak loving words to them. And know that you can always say anything you have to say in a loving way. And if you can't figure out how to do that, that's what I'm here for. So let me know. And at work or at home, that includes, we got, we're bringing love back into the workplace because that's the opposite of weakness. The opposite of weakness is not strength. It is love. And I hope that I could help you a little bit, give you some words that'll help you remember who you are during that miraculous instant. 
If you need any more help, stop by danrocondotraining.com. If you have not yet subscribed to this channel, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm disappointed. <laughs> so please do that. And for everybody here at Danrocondo Training, including my mom, my brother, and everybody that's here with us physically and in the great beyond, <laughs> this is Dan O'Connor signing off. Uh, 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 next time I'll have me again, buddy. Stop by. Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. I gotta go.